All right, it's so good to see you out there uh, so early. Well, it's not really early, but it's good to see you. Some of you are here early this evening, and uh, I am just so delighted to be here with you to share in this experience of uh, delving into the book of Revelation. I also want to welcome those of you who are online. Uh, it's always uh, good to see you logging on early and I see some of you, you know, corresponding or interacting with our chat monitors. I see our chat monitors on spot, uh, ready to interact with you. And uh, we're just going to have a wonderful time this evening as we look further into the book of Revelation. Now, for those of you who are online and also in the sanctuary, I am going to, can I encourage you, can I ask you to share these wonderful meetings with your friends by, you know, sharing in your WhatsApp group, sending the link, uh, sending the registration form so that your friends can register and so that they can receive the lessons and that they can participate. Uh, it is very simple. And so I'm going to encourage you to do so. Send reminders each time we meet that your, your friends, your family will have access to these meetings. Now, this evening, we are going to be looking at an important very important topic. It is salvation by grace. What did I say? Right. Salvation by grace. Now, I, as I get my instrument ready, I should be more precise with the topic this evening because I left off a word which is very critical. It is salvation by grace alone. And we can't ignore that point. And we're going to see why in just a few minutes. But what does this have to do with the book of Revelation? Well, turn with me in the book of Revelation to Revelation chapter 5. This is not in your lessons. And I'm going to ask the, the, the tech team if they can um, assist me in putting this text on the screen. It's Revelation chapter 5, and I want us to look on verse 8. We're going to read it together, verse 8. We're going to look at verse 9 all the way through 12. I want us to read that text before we get into this lesson. giving the tech team some time to uh, find that text and to put it up on the screen. But if you have your Bibles, you should have your Bibles in, uh, on hand or in your phone. I'm going to ask you to turn to that text. So here we go. Let's read it together. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of, the, of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders 
and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Yes. So this is a scene that John the Revelator saw in heaven. And he saw Jesus exalted, receiving worship. Now, one thing I like about, about the book of Revelation is that whereas in the rest of the Bible, the other books shed some light on some aspect of Christ's ministry. Uh, you, know, you know, different books talk about different uh, roles that, that he would play throughout the history of earth. Some talk about him coming as a babe. Some talk about him ministering as our high priest, like the book of Hebrews speaks of him as the high priest and also the sacrifice. But one thing I like about the book of Revelation is that it covers all aspects of Christ's ministry. We will see as we go ahead, uh, further in the book of Revelation that it's, it speaks of Christ coming as a, a babe. It talks of him... Um, you know, coming on earth and ministering like he did in the Gospels. It speaks of him exalted in heaven. John sees him in heaven exalted as a king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. John sees him receiving worship from angels. John sees him in heaven coming back as the conquering king coming to put an end to the reign of sin and terror on planet earth. So it covers all aspects of Christ's ministry. That's what I like about the book of Revelation. But in this scene, in Revelation chapter 5, we see angels and we see um, the, what the Bible calls elders, the 24 elders, millions of angels worshipping Jesus. And they worship him, they say, because... He has redeemed men from sin through his blood. And he will make them. Let's look at it. I want you to tell me. Look at verse, verse 5. Sorry, chapter 5 and verse 10. And he has made us unto our God what? Huh? Boy, you said, you said, timid. Kings and priests. Who is he going to make kings and priests? Huh? Huh? Yeah, well, you're all timid, man. All, you, know, you know, I think it's me, you know. <laughs> yes. He's going to make us, right, kings and priests. That is what God has in store for us. Remember, we read yesterday... In Revelation 3 verse 20 and 21. That to him who, who overcome. He will make sit with him in his, on his throne. So it is. It complements what, what we have already seen in the book of Revelation. So this is what God has in store for all of us. You see. Human beings who are redeemed. And so. The reason why I emphasize this. Is that. Only those who experience the salvation of God will reign with him as kings and priests in that scene. Like in that scene that we see in Revelation 5. And so it is imperative that we understand what it means to be redeemed. We understand what it means to be saved. For uh, if we are not saved at the end of the day, then our 
knowledge of the book of Revelation would have been a futile exercise. But it is because Jesus wants us to be among the number who will experience these blessings in Revelation 5, the redeemed. Why we study the book of Revelation. And so therefore we look at salvation by grace alone. All right. So let's get down into the word. We know that salvation is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian church. And so we look at what it is. What is salvation? What is salvation? Well, Romans 6 verse 23 tells us, gives us a clue. What does it say? Romans 6 verse 23 it says, for the wages of sin is death. Uh-huh. Did we do our lessons? We did our lessons. All right, so I want you to work with me, to tell me, so that I can know that you did your lessons. All right, so the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life is a gift that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I also would like to say right here that eternal life comes through no other way but through Jesus Christ, the Lord. Right? Jesus himself said so that when he was here that I am the who knows that text I am the the way the truth and the all right you know it you know it so eternal life comes through Jesus Christ who is the Lord so what is salvation salvation is the deliverance from sin and its penalty or its consequence, the ultimate consequence, which is eternal death. And it results in eternal life with God. And that is what God wants. That is what Jesus wants. That, that, that is the theme throughout the Bible from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned. God put in place a plan of salvation so that sinners will have a second chance. Humanity, the human race would have a chance to experience eternal life. Now, why do we need salvation? It should be obvious already. But we're going to look at it nonetheless. Why do we need it? Okay. Let's look at Revelation 20 verse 15. We should have written out the answer already. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was? Okay. Let's read it for the benefit of those. I'm going to read it for the benefit of those who have not had the chance to do their lessons. It says, And whosoever was not found in, sorry, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We're going to talk about this lake of fire. In a future lesson. But suffice it to say right now that those who are not saved will end up in the book, sorry, will end up in the lake of fire. And for one to avoid this lake of fire, your name has to be written in this book of life. Good.
Now, sin is the problem. The wages of sin is death. How does humanity get rid of sin? How does God solve, solve this sin problem, this sin issue? This evening we have Alessi reading, reading for us. Alessi, are you ready to read? All right. Let's start with John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that so whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wonderful. Alessi wasn't even reading. She was reciting from memory. I'm so proud of you. Yes. And that, that's how simple it is, uh, my friends. The plan of salvation. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. Also. I like John 3.17, which comes right after. And I'm going to ask Alice to read it for me. Uh, Alice, John 3.17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, so God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. I want us to underline that in our Bibles. When we read the Bible or when we, he when we hear people talk about Christianity and talk about God, especially God the Father, some will give us the impression that God is an austere being who is looking for the simplest opportunity to destroy sinners, to punish sinners, right? But the Bible tells us that God does not want, does not, he, did, he did not send Jesus to condemn, but he sent Jesus so that the world through him might be saved. So God's posture, his posture all throughout the scriptures is that he is willing, he wants us to be saved. He wants as many of us to be saved. Whosoever will, is what he says, can be saved if they accept his salvation. So I want us to, to rivet that point in our mind that God is rooting for us. You see, he wants us to experience the salvation. Now, Revelation 1 verse 5 also, also gives us more information about this whole matter of salvation. Alessia, could you read it for us, please? And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. All right. So, Revelation is consistent with the rest of the Bible as it, it tells us over and over how Jesus is interested in our salvation, how he loved us, and how he has made provisions that we might be saved. And so, in Revelation 1.5, it says that he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation cannot be more clear that Jesus wants to save us. But we are looking at this process of salvation. Now, what do we call this gift from God? sending his son, his only son, to die. Well, Ephesians 2 verse 8, 
describes it. And so, uh, Alessi? Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. All right. So in Ephesians 2 verse 8, this gift is called what? Did anybody get it? Y'all, so uncertain. What is the gift called? In Ephesians, I, I cannot hear it. It's kind of, it's kind of, um, no, it's kind of timid. I cannot hear it over here, you know. It said eternal life. No, but I don't see eternal life in that text. Yes, according to that text. What is it called, this gift? This, uh, it's called grace. Yes, for it is by grace are you saved through faith. And notice it says, and not of yourselves. It is a what? It is a, it is a gift of God. A gift. Now, what is this salvation by grace? What is this salvation? Well, let's look at a few texts. Revelation 22, 7. Alessi? Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sins of the prophecy of this book. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have said 22, verse 17. <laughs> what did I say? Seven? Oh, I'm so sorry, Lacey. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. All right. So, in Revelation, there is an invitation that says uh, that we should come. And, you know, anyone who wishes this free gift can come. It is for our taking. But let's look further. Titus 3, verse 5. Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so it is not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Can somebody tell me what is works of righteousness that we do? Somebody said good things. All right. Giving things to the poor, giving alms, praying for people. Okay. What else? The works of righteousness. Huh? Somebody said soul winning. So I take it to mean that you, 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 you are a missionary. You are, you know, you, 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 um, you evangelize and you share the gospel. Okay, so that's good works. Yes. Keeping the law. Okay, yes. Good works. Good works. Keeping the law. Anybody else? Visiting the sick and those who are in prison. All of those things are good works. Right? But what does the text say about good, uh, good works in relation to salvation? Can these, doing these things, visiting the sick, praying for the sick, save us? Are we saved by doing these things? No? Okay. But aren't these things important? Ah, all right. So let's, let's look further at this thing. So we are not saved by these works of righteousness, which we do. But it is because of God's mercy. It is because of what he does, the gift that he gives us, why we are saved. So I want us to be very clear on that. Right? 
not of these works, lest any man should boast. Now, how do we get salvation? Revelation 2 verse 5 tells us. Revelation 2 Revel verse 5. Yes. Revelation 2 verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. All right. So in Revelation chapter 2, we read, read uh, Jesus speaking to John, says that we are to repent. So we hear about this word, repent. Now let's look at Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Alicia, would you read it for us? Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Okay. So here it is again that Peter preaching in the book of Acts told the people that they are to repent and be converted that their sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So they had to repent. All right? Now, let's go further. What is the role of faith in receiving salvation? What is the role of faith in this whole process of salvation? We read already John 3.16 that so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... What's the next word? We have to believe. Right? We have to trust. We have to depend on him. On what he says. That is faith. That is how we receive it. We should not perish but have eternal life. Now, let's look at what Revelation 2, verse 10 says. Revelation 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall, come again, shall, cast, shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tired, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. All right, so here we come across this word again, this word of being faithful. So we have to learn, so we have to trust. When we hear the word faith, we have to uh, believe in God, believe in his promises, right? And so that is how we receive salvation. God said it, and I believe it, and what the song says, and that is, that is good enough for me. Yeah, yes, yes, you all know the song. Good, right. So we have to believe and trust what God says and depend on what the word of God says. That is faith. All right. Now, what does the Galatians 2, 16 say about righteousness? By faith. Righteousness by faith. Let's hear what Galatians 2.16 says. Galatians 2 verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. All right. So we, so we are seeing some, some new words. We have been exposed to some new words in the scripture. So first we hear about righteousness. What is righteousness? Somebody said right doing. Right? You're saying that, that that's the obvious, right? 
<laughs> okay. Anybody else wants to, to, to give a different angle on it? Righteousness. What is righteousness? Or it seems as if that answer is sufficient um, for you. Right doing. Okay. All right. Jason, you want to try? Let everybody hear you. Following the law. Okay. Yes. If it's a good law, following the law is, yes, is, it's righteousness. Yes. Good. No, we read about justifi being justified. What is it? What, what does the word justify mean? How do you, what is justification? What is justifying something? Who wants to take a try? No, don't read from it. Tell me in your own words. <laughs> You're cheating. <laughs> All right. How many of us, let, 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 let me see if I can give an example. How many of us use the word processor, word, Microsoft Word. You all should be familiar with it. And Google Docs and, you know, and most word processors. Now, there's a function in these word processors that is called justify, right? You, you use this function to, huh? Say it. To have the two sides equal. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm saying it properly, but it's just that it's in, in uniformity. Okay. Uh, to have the words, to have the paragraphs aligned, in uni uniformed, right? Yes, yes, right. So that's the idea. So to justify something is to make it right, right? To make it, to correct it, to, to align it properly. That is justification. Yes, and it's, a, it's the same thing, the same idea in, this, in the spiritual realm. So when you, um, when you are justified, what do you think it means in the, in the spiritual realm? Huh? To make yourself right with God. And allow the Lord to, to, to put you how he wants to put you. That's what I'm thinking. In my own words. Okay. So you're saying two things. You're saying that you make yourself right with God? Or what? And allow God to make you right then. So, or align you according to his precepts and his principles. So it's either or. It's, are, are you saying that it is both? Yes. <laughs> okay. So we have a part to play in salvation as well. We have a part in salvation. So, allowing, allowing God to come in and do his work, we have to give him the allowance. It's not just to just come in like that. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, you're a thinking student. All right. Yes. Yes. You want to give it a try? All right. Let me hear. I would, I would say by putting God first. Okay. By, by putting God first. First, all right, okay, fair enough. But let me go back to what Sharma said. Um, by allowing, what did you say first? I, I don't want to get it wrong. Allowing, uh, I don't know me to remember. <laughs> I, I was basically saying that we allow God to, to make us right. And then, or, or, or we align or something that effect. I can't recall what I said. Okay. It sounds like the answer is evolving. <laughs> so justification, right, is allowing God, well, it is God's um, work, him, God, doing his work, well, or declaring us to be right. God making us right, you see. And not we becoming right. I think that was your first answer that you that you had said, right? And um, and I want to differentiate the two. You see, because when you put self in it, as if 
you know, that we have a, well, we, uh, let me be careful here, because we do, play, as you said, we do play a part. But when you, when you, when we put self in the picture as if, as if we make ourselves right, we cannot do that. We cannot, we cannot make ourselves right. But what we can do is that by faith we accept God's uh, gift of grace, of salvation. And it is God who first declares us to be righteous. That is justification. And then we are going to look at something else that God does for us in a short while. But it is all God's doing and not anything from us. We are going to see that. And I am emphasizing this because as I said, this whole business of salvation is important, very important. Now, righteousness refers to a state of being in right standing with God. Living a life which is pleasing to him and in line with his will. In short, righteousness is obedience to God's law. All right. The, this righteousness is not something that we can achieve on our own, but it is a gift of God that is received by faith in Jesus. Good. Now, justification. When we are justified, justification refers to a legal declaration of our righteousness that we receive when we accept Jesus as our Savior. So, when we are convicted that we are sinful and in need of salvation, and we believe that Jesus came from God to save us from our sins, as John 3.16 says, that when we believe, whosoever believe will not perish, but have what? So when we believe that and accept it, God declares us righteous. It is a gift of God. You see, it is not anything that we need. We don't receive it by, by, uh, by works, by, by have to be, we don't have to, we don't receive it by needing to recite a prayer or to do good things, you, you see, to, um, to, to add up on, on our account so as to, to get in the good books of God. No, we just believe, we accept it by faith. And at that moment, God declares us righteous. How easy could God make it for us as sinners to be saved? All right, let's think about it. We have a hand here. Question or a comment? Verse. Read it. Oh, it's Romans 2, verse 13. And it says, For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So I, I am just looking at this verse, and it seems to be like a, a little contradiction. Yeah, and I know there's a, there's a reconciliation to it because I think one is talking about the sacrificial law and the, and the other is talking about the other law. That's, that's what I think. Um, and there are other scriptures to substantiate that. So. All right, I didn't get your name. Christopher. Christopher. All right, Christopher. Very, a very good question. Um, how do we reconcile that text from Romans that says it is not the, the hearers of the law that are justified, but the doers of the law who will be justified? So if we just hold on a little bit, Christopher, we're going to get to that. 
as we, um, as we go further down into this study. Now, salvation. We are talking about salvation. So, of course, salvation refers to the overall process of being saved. And it includes justification. Another term that we are going to look at now, sanctification. And ultimately, glorification. What are these? Now, we looked at justification already. But we are going to look at sanctification now. Who is familiar with the word sanctification? All right, so do you, do you mind defining it in your own words? Well, based on what the Bible says, what I understand it, to, be, to, make, to, be, to make holy, right? When you sanctify something, make it holy. <laughs> okay, so to sanctify is to make something holy. Anybody else wants to try? One definition was setting apart as being holy. Okay, to set something apart as being holy. Anybody else? All right. Huh? Sanctified by God. Okay, so we are sanctified by God. God is the one who sanctifies us, yes. All right, so that's pretty much, or oh, you want to add something to it? I read something that sanctification is habitual communion with God. What is the difference between that and make to, to make holy? Okay, so you read, so you're asking this question. Okay, habitual communion with God. Okay. Um, hmm. I guess you could, uh, you could look at it that way, but let's stick with the first answer that you gave, to make, uh, to make holy. Now, we know, well, the Bible says that God is holy and that he is also a, a, a consuming fire and that sin cannot exist in his immediate presence. And so, therefore, it stands to reason that if, if one would, is going to have continual communion with God, then one would have to be sanctified. So that explains that, you see. Now, sanctification. So true repentance and justification leads to, lead to sanctification. They are closely related. They are distinct, but they are not, never separate. And they designate the two phases of salvation. Justification is what God does for us, while sanctification is what God does in us. Right? So, both of them, it is God who does it for us. I like this text in uh, Philippians. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I'm going off script. But there is a text in, is it Philippians chapter 2? That I like to use when I am teaching this topic. All right, it's not coming to, I'll find it. It's chapter one. Oh, somebody knows it. Okay, yes. Philippians 1 verse 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yes, but there's another text that I, am, that I had in mind in Philippians. It wasn't this one, but this one is good. Thank you for that. So it is God who begins the work or does the work in us. You see, 
But the next text will come to mind. So it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we receive the righteousness from God. It, it leads to our justification when we are declared righteous and also it leads to sanctification by him working in us. Him transforming our characters. Remember, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we are going to look at verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I don't know if Alice is able to find it at this short notice. Okay, you are sharp. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, so when we are in Christ, we become what? New, a new creature, a new person. Right? Again, in Philippians 2, I don't know why I like Philippians 2, um, Philippians so much. But Paul talks about, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 or 6, there are about that when we are in Christ, we receive a new mind, a new heart, or a new mind. Right? Let this mind be in you, which was in? So he gives us and it is all his doing. You see. Now, going back to Ephesians chapter 2. Going back to Ephesians chapter 2. We looked at it, verse 8. Look at verse 8. And we're going to look at verse 9 and 10. Because Christopher asked a question which I don't want to forget. In, in Romans 2 verse 13, for not the hearers of the law, are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. How do we reconcile that text with all of what I've been saying so far about this gift of salvation, the justification and the sanctification being a gift from God? Well, Maybe this text can help us. For by grace, we read it already. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now look at verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, what is Paul saying? When we receive the grace of God by faith, when we receive that salvation, We become God's workmanship and we are created unto what? Huh? We are created unto good works. Now what does that mean? What is Paul saying there? What is Paul saying? I was thinking as a result of 
what Christ has done for us, then we will do the work. And it's not we doing it as you rightfully say. It's Christ in us doing it because of we are saved by his grace. Aha. Uh -huh. There you have it. So when we accept, when we receive the grace by faith, he recreates in us a new heart. Remember, he also said that we, are, we become new what? We become new creatures and we are created unto good works, you see. So therefore, the good works is evidence. It becomes the evidence that we have experienced conversion. But it is not the good works that cause us to be saved. Do you see the difference? Right. So it is a cause and effect. We receive it by faith. We are transformed. It is God who works in us. Right? And recreates us unto good works. But it is not works that make us, that save us. Is that clear? All right. Salvation by grace alone. You had a, a question, Pan? No, there was a scripture I was trying to try to say, but we do as a free word and not hear us from the decision of Moses, or it's the man we were talking about. Okay. Um, no, I was just saying that James, James 1, 22, and, three, and 23 said, But be he doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own self. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, is like unto a man beholding his na natural face in a glass. So when we become, as I say, we are his workmanship, we are God's witness, we are God's witnesses, right? And, and it, it, it does come automatically, you just, be, you just begin to work for Christ. Some of us may be doing for that, but... If you are doing to show the world, you know, to get started, it's not going nowhere. But, but, but when, you, when, you, when you take on Christ, you just naturally do good because you want to do what the Lord wants. You want to please God. So it just naturally works. It just comes. It just comes. Okay, well, nicely put. Yes. And that's another text. And you can see where the Bible is consistent on that point. That when we experience salvation, it results in good works, you see. But we are not saved by good works. Now, what are the steps to receiving salvation? Now, Alessi read Revelation 22, verse 17 already. So, whosoever is athirst, we need to come. So, we need to make that step because God won't force us. He won't impose himself or his will upon us. So he says, come, but we have to make the step to go to him and to, or to accept his salvation freely. We must believe John 3, 16, right? We must accept what he has given us. Now, let's look at 1 John 1, verse 9, to some practical steps. When we are con Convicted by the Holy Spirit of our need for salvation. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 9. Alessi. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and also to to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who does the cleansing? Is it us who cleanse ourselves? It is who? Jesus. Jesus who cleanses. Good. Romans 5 verse 1. Alessi. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we are justified by faith is what uh, Romans again tells us that the, 
This justification comes by faith. So, we must confess our sins to God, ask for his forgiveness. Confession involves admitting our wrongs and seeking God's mercy. And through faith in Jesus, we are declared righteous and justified before God. So, so in, on the books in heaven, he declares us righteous when we come to him and confess and we accept Jesus' salvation. He writes justified or covered against, against or beside our name in the books in heaven. He declares us righteous. But the Bible also tells us that he cleanses us too recreates in us a new heart so that we are sanctified. Now, when we are sanctified, when we are sanctified, it leads to something, to a next step. When we are sanctified, Let's look at what Revelation 2 verse 5 says. Revelation 2 verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Okay. And we also looked at Acts, 9, Acts 3 verse 19 um, already. Okay, so repent. What is repentance? Who wants to, to try that one? Repentance. Okay, let's hear Junior. Repentance is being sorry for your sins and turning away from it. All right, well, well put. So, so, well put. All right, let me hear, let me hear this one. Repent, re repentance is forgiveness? No, not quite. So let's, um, let's stick with what Junior said. Junior said it is feeling sorry for sin and turning away from sin. Do we have the power, the strength to turn away from sin on our own? Uh-uh. No. We cannot do anything by ourselves. Absolutely. Remember Jesus said in John um, chapter 15 that without me, ye can do what? Nothing. Nothing. So it is Jesus who has come into our hearts to give us the this, this strength and the impetus to turn away from sin. Right? So it's all Jesus. Jesus is everything. <laughs> you see how Jesus is important? Yes, right. No, let's press on. Sanctification, we looked at that already. No. In this whole process of salvation, what is the role of baptism? Remember, when Jesus was on earth, he said that except ye are baptized, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. I'm just putting it in a nice way. That's how he said it in, in Mark, um, chapter 16. That he, he, he who is not baptized, he will be, he will be um, I mean, I'm even reluctant to use the word. Yes. Even what is in the Bible. <laughs> he will be damned. Those who don't, are not. So what does baptism have to do in this whole process of salvation? We want to look at that. So Alice is going to read for us Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Yes. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. All right. So this process of baptism, it, uh, it, it puts together the whole process of salvation. 
right? Now, so when we come to Christ, when we are justified, and he recreates in us his mind, or he puts his mind in us. Let this, somebody over here, or somewhere said, let this mind be in Christ, which was in Christ, Jesus. Now, let this mind be in us, which, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 6, there about. What happens to the old mind? Huh? Supposed to be buried. The old man is supposed to be buried. Okay. The old, man is, the old mind is supposed to be buried. So what happened before you, you bury it? You can bury a live man? Or should we? Well, you put the live person in, but the ways of the person must go. So before you bury somebody, what must, what, what must happen to the person first? <laughs> the person must, must die. Yes, the person ought to die. So the old person dies. And when we accept Jesus and the life that he, the salvation that he gives, the old person, the old man dies. And it is, um, and as Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, we demonstrate this process by the act of baptism. And so therefore, when we receive the salvation of God, when we recognize that we are sinful and in need of his grace, the Holy Spirit comes in us, the old man dies, and we go into the watery grave of baptism to bury the old man, you see. And as Paul says in Romans 6 verse 4, that when we go and bury the old man, we are resurrected, a new person, a new creature, right? With a new mind. That is what baptism symbolizes. And it is a public expression that we believe that Jesus died for us, that he is recreating himself in us, He's putting his mind in us and we are coming up a new creature. And that is why um, Paul also says that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Right. It is not I know, but Christ which lives in me. So you see how oh, all of these passages are lining up or oh, how they are agreeing with each other. It's all about Christ and his salvation by faith. Now, having heard all of this, are you ready to receive the free gift of salvation? I must tell you that every single day I give thanks and I rejoice for the marvelous gift of salvation that God has given every man and it's as if I recommit myself to him every day you see I am just so thankful for what Jesus has done for me and what he has done for the whole world if we would just accept his gift of salvation I pray that your answer will be yes and by saying yes and accepting his gift of salvation we will be among the redeemed to live and reign with Jesus forever, as the book of Revelation says. And we will be kings and priests. And in this gender-inclusive world, I may have to say queens as well. <laughs> but I will just stick with what the Bible says, that we'll all reign as kings. God will work it out when he gets there as to how each gender will reign as kings. What do you say? Amen, amen, amen. Now we are going to be doing our quiz tonight. Our quiz. But while the, elder, the ushers hand out the quiz, I'm going to ask you to 
to just bow your heads with me, and if the ushers could, could just pause as we bring this session to a close with prayer. It's a, it's a very important topic. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we are so thankful for your gift of salvation. Salvation by grace alone. Father, we are not worthy to receive such an awesome gift of eternal life. And we cannot recommend ourselves to you because we have nothing with which to recommend ourselves. And so, Lord, we gladly accept what Jesus has done for us, his gift of salvation that he wants to bestow on us. May every person here tonight receive it gladly so that when you shall come, we will go home with you forever. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to our quiz tonight. But tonight, the quiz is not true and false. True or false, it's not. Yes. It's now fill in the blanks. <laughs> yes, man. It fill in the blanks. And so, number one, for by grace are ye saved through what? Don't answer. Don't, 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 don't show the answer. Just write it on the paper. And those of you who are online, click on the link. Put in your name. Type in your name. Type in your email address. Type it in. And then type in your answers online. Right? And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some advice. So those of you who are in sanctuary, you know, the quiz is kind of easier online. Because I think when they, once they click on the link, they have all the questions and the questions are there so they can, you know, go back and look at them so it's easier. Rather than depending on me to read the questions for you. But number one, for by grace are ye saved through blank. That's easy. We have been saying it all night. So number two. Number two. Listen carefully now. Number two. Knowing that a man is blank, justified by the works of the law. Knowing that a man is blank, justified by the works of the law. Hint, 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 a clue. It is actually a text. One of the texts that is in the lesson. Knowing, but you can figure it out, you know. If, if you have listened to me all night, if you listen to me all night, you can make a good guess. <laughs> Knowing that a man is blank, justified by the works of the law. If you look at the last part of the sentence, you can figure out that what that blank is. I'm giving you too much now because you must get it. Number three. Number three. If we blank our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and blank us from all unrighteousness. By the way, these are our passages, you know. They are scripture passages. And we read all of them tonight. And we emphasize them. So if we blank our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to blank us from all unrighteousness. Number four. Therefore, being blank by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being blank by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And lastly, therefore, we are buried with him by blank into death. We are buried with him by blank into death. They are all scripture passages. 
Somebody, make up, somebody is squirming in their face. I said, mm. <laughs> yes. But that was one of the most recent texts that, that, that we read. <laughs> yes, that was very recent. So if all, if any of them, you should get right is that one. <laughs> somebody said yes. So, so let me just run back through them real quick. For those who are here, for by grace are ye saved through blank. Number two, knowing that a man is blank, justified by the works of the law. <laughs> if, if, we, if we blank our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and blank us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, being blank by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by blank into his death. Ushers, where are you? It's time to call it the envelopes. Number three. Somebody said all of them one more time. So let me start from number one. For by grace are ye saved through blank. Number two, knowing that a man is blank, justified by the works of the law. Number three, if we, and number three is a very popular text, if you really think about it. If we blank our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to blank us from all unrighteousness. And number four, therefore being blank by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And number five and last, therefore, we are buried with him by blank into death. So the, the envelopes are being collected. How many of us got all right? Wow, you're so confident. So many of you are so confident. All right. Somebody put up two hands. All right. So we're going to take the answers now while we get ready for the Q&A. And, a. and uh, tonight we have Ron and Christine again. But let us look at the answers. The answers. Number one. For by grace are ye saved through what? Through faith. There you go. All right. Number two. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Not. Number three. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Number four. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And number five, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. There you will have it. Who got all five right? Wow. Amen. Congratulations. Give yourself a round of applause. You did, you did well. You did well. And those who got four, you know, congrats to you too. <laughs> keep on, keep on going at them. We are going to have our Q&A at this time, and so I invite Christine and Ron, who will come and join me, who will join me this evening to answer the questions that you will have. All right. I should let you know that coming up on Wednesday, Wednesday at 7, we meet again and we will be looking at the, the judgment hour, part one. We are going to be doing it in two, in two parts and we will be looking at the first part on Wednesday and it is the hour of his judgment, part one, the hour of his judgment. So you would realize now that, you know, uh, we're getting down into some serious stuff in the book of Revelation. We are now redeemed. We have accepted salvation. We have an obligation now 
as uh, the people of God. And we have the judgment that we are going to look into. I promise it's going to be an, an interesting topic um, for you. And so, invite your friends. Come along 7 o'clock on Wednesday as we delve into the, uh, the judgment hour. So, for this evening, we are going to now delve into the Q&A. On that note, we are inviting you to the mic to come and ask your question. There is a mic there on the floor. Feel free to go to the mic and ask your questions. All right. So I remember, Christine and Ron, that there, there were two questions, or three, from yesterday that were held over until, to, until tonight. So there was one that had to do with um, God making us for his glory. And how does that relate to the text in, Ezekiel, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13? Um, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Right, yes. No, that was, I believe, um, uh, Patricia's question. Okay. Yes. Yes. But, but, but while I... I, while I I thought about, well, I thought about the question last night. I wonder if, if, if Patricia actually meant Revelation 14, verse 6, where it says, fear God and give him the glory. I wonder if, if that was what she meant, um, because the, the text in Ezekiel, in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, doesn't say, fear God and give him glory. So I'm just wondering if, if, if that's what she meant. Go to the mic, Pat. Um, Patricia, please go to the mic. Okay. So, all right. So, if it is that it is Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, that speaks to the uh, fear God and, you know, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. For God shall bring every word into judgment. Right. How does it relate to the, um, Isaiah 43, verse 7? I believe. And Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And it, I think she was referring to the point, to the part where it says that I have created God, uh, sorry, God is saying that I have created him man for my glory. For my glory. Yes. But, 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 but. Uh, when you fear God, it's basically the giving honor, right? So yes. when 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 you when you are created for Christ's glory, you're giving honor, you're giving praise and thankfulness. That is why I was saying that this this passage here, Ezekiel, Ecclesiastic twelve thirteen, is basically saying that it is giving God glory. Is not the same thing. Oh, I don't okay. Know. So Oh. So you're pretty much saying, answering oh, your question. Coming. So yes. It's so the yes. same thing. Okay. Yes. It pretty much. Yes. You could look at I'm, it that way. Okay. Okay. Yes. So there's another question from um, Ellis Sam, Smiley. Yes. Right. About uh, why why did the serpent or the Satan acting to the serpent say to Eve that you shall not surely die instead of of uh, directly contradicting God and saying that you that you um, that you won't die. Um, well, which pretty much is saying the same thing. But he was. I think the question the question was I'm trying to remember uh, why why did he use the word surely, not surely, the phrase not surely. And so I don't know. Well, what I, I don't know if you want to give it a oh, try, Christine. I mean, what I realize when um, people want to um, indoctrinate people or force them to believe a half truth is always better than a full lie. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, so I think that's why the devil is the father of lies, and he would have known that. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And exactly. it is a strategy that you see uh, that Satan used. Well, we see that he used it more than once. So he used it in the Garden of Eden with, um, with Eve. Eve. Yes. But then he used it again with Jesus when Jesus was in the wilderness. And, you know, he quoted scripture, but he kind of twisted it. Psalm 91. He kind of 
he kind of took out something out of it and, 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 you know, and tried to get um, Christ to do something that was contrary to God's will. So it is the same um, strategy that he uses to, to, to kind of tweak the scripture to suit his purpose. And that is why the Bible says that he is subtle, you see. And that is what he does. And that is, as we go through the book of Revelation, we are going to see how uh, Satan doesn't attack the Bible frontally per se. But he, you're going to see that in his master plan, his master strategy that he will use to deceive the world in the last day, the, whole, the entire world, and get most of the world to follow him, is to tweet the scriptures, right? So look out for that as we go further into the study of the book of Revelation. We know a question here says, I still don't understand how my heart can be changed. I want to, but... Sorry, I want to, but me still, I think, oh, me still drink the rum sometimes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Roman 7. You want to go ahead? You want to go ahead? Go okay. ahead. <laughs> All right, there's a text in Romans. I, I can't tie it down to the exact chapter just now. But it says that the thing I would not do is the thing that I do. But at the Sorry. end of it, there was hope. It says that, no, it's not I that do it, but Christ that liveth in me. So I say to that person that keep looking to Christ for the victory. For Christ will certainly not leave you alone. He will make you victorious. Yes, and, and I absolutely agree that it is, it, is God, uh, who will, it is God who will make the change. And if you continue looking to Jesus... He will effect the change in your heart. The good thing is that you have the desire. And that is what is important. We need to start with the desire to, uh, to experience that change. And once you, once you have that and you commit, you, you commit yourself to God, you, you submit yourselves and, to God and open up yourself to him, he says that he will, um, he will come in and do the, that good work right. in you. And so that he who begun... Yeah, okay. The good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So my advice, my admonition to, to that person is that they continue to hold on to Jesus. Look to him and he will effect the change. Okay, there's a question from last night that is now being given to us again. It says, I thought we answered, but let us look at it. Question from Tanya. The question is, is it sin which leads to eternal death? The solution, resurrect us. If we so choose to accept God's plan of salvation and restoration, we can choose to remain an old man, choose to remain dead because of sin, or choose to be born again. The old guy is dead, one way or the other. It is whether the old guy wants to be made into a new guy a different creation, no, from Zoom. Kind of a bit cryptic. Yeah. But we'll let us break it down. Yes. I, I'll attempt to break it down. So the first question really is saying, is it sin which leads to eternal death? The solution resurrect us. If we so choose to accept God's plan of salvation and res restoration. So I'm interpreting this point here to mean for example the question is asked is it sin which leads to death well not just death, but to eternal death um looking at it in depth in a sense sin itself doesn't lead to eternal death and bear with me now <laughs> eternal death but a continuation in sin continually not seeking to Ask God to forgive you and to let you overcome. Right? So where that point is, where that aspect of the question is concerned, the person went on to say, if we so choose to accept God's plan of salvation and restoration, which means that if we so choose that, then certainly we'll be delivered from sin. Right? But if we reject that, 
then we will not be delivered from sin. Then the other aspect of it says, we can choose to remain an old man, choose to remain dead because of sin, or choose to be born again. Again, the choice is ours. He either choose God, I think it's Deuteronomy El Arangling, where God had spoken to Moses, telling the children of Israel, choose life. Yes. He encouraged them to choose life. You know, he laid out all the benefits of choosing life, and then he laid out all the bad stuff that will happen if one did not choose life. So even from the Old Testament, come right through, and Christ again reiterated it in the, 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 the Gospels when he said that if you accept me then I will be your savior I'll be your Lord I'll be able to guide you and to make well your journey through this life right so I'm just trying to break it down further and to see what the last part of it says here we can choose to remain an old man which is true, or you can choose to remain dead because of sin, or choose to be born again. Now, Ella Ranglin emphasizes the requirement to be born again. Ella, you want to reiterate it for us? Why God requires of us to be born again? I think it was, was it the second lesson on Sabbath that you went through it? Oh, um, it must have been. It would have been yes. yesterday. Yes. 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 And the question is, what, why is it important? Right. Let us say why is it important. Or it says here, or choose to be born again. Well, because of the nature of, of um, humanity, I think it was a lesson that we right. dealt with. Right. So, we, so we found ourselves in a predicament where all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says um, emphatically that the wages of sin uh, is death. And so there it, ne it necessitates um us having to um you know to to receive the salvation of god which is what we talk about tonight right and which comes to us by by um by faith right. so so it is because that um all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god why um you know salvation is important why we need to to uh receive the gift of eternal, eternal life, eternal life right. that God gives us through Christ Jesus. So let me Jesus. close off on this question now. Thanks, Ella. The old guy is dead one way or the other. It is whether the old guy wants to be made into a new guy, a different creation. And I think you alluded to that this evening again. The new creation. Yes. So we do endorse the new creation. Okay. Uh, yes. Someone is at the mic. Brother Roper, go ahead. Yeah, um, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gate into the city. Is there a contradiction about a free gift that the, the elder mentioned during the presentation? And this one said that, blessed are they that do the commandment, that they may have access. So his, his, his presentation was, grace is a free gift. Yes. And this verse here is saying that blessed are they that do yes. his commandment that they may have right to the tree. So I'm asking if there's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. no. Right. Okay. Sure, no problem. You know, the, the, the elder in his presentation emphasized that we should listen so that we will not run into these so-called contradictions. Remember he said in his presentation that it is Christ who will it in us to do so having accepted Christ as your personal savior, he was explaining the concepts of justification, of righteousness, of salvation, and of sanctification. And in the corner, Christian and I was emphasizing the word faith, because all these are obtained through faith. Um, justification by faith, righteousness by faith, salvation by faith, sanctification by faith. So the, the matter here, Brother Roper, would point to righteousness by faith. And I'll highlight that by saying that, having obtained that through Christ, we are now empowered yes. 
to keep the Ten Commandments. And keeping the Ten Commandments, we do not see them as keeping them to save us. Who alone saves? Now that's a question to you all. Who alone saves? It is Jesus. Yes, the elder pointed out that today in his presentation. So that's the quarter concerning that brother Roper. If I you just, want to extend, I, no, go ahead. I just want to read a verse. Sure. Ezekiel 36 verse 7. Yes. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and yes. to keep my commandments. I just find a verse yes. that answer. If Christ is in us, yes. then we can do it as Ezekiel 36 verse Definitely. And that work is not our own doing. Yeah. It is righteousness right. by faith right. in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. And so, so there's no contradiction. Uh, so as, yeah. as you said, and, and, and it's a text that I was trying to, to remember when I was in the, in the presentation. It's actually Philippians 2 verse, um, verse 13, which right. helps here. And it says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Yeah. So when we accept the gift of salvation, it, God works in us. When he sanctifies us, mm -hmm. he, he, he recreates his image in us. And it enables us to keep his commandments. Um, and so therefore, when we read that text in Revelation chapter 22, the one in James chapter 2, uh, you, it, it, you will find that it then becomes obligatory for somebody who is saved to keep his commandments, to keep his laws. Because you can't say that you are saved. You are you're hear, hearers of the law. Right, and not then doors. and they're not doing it. I, I, I not doers of the law, because so you know that leads to a question. You know what kind of experience you really had? Was it a genuine uh, conversion? Yes. Because when it is when you had the genuine conversion, God's put His Spirit in you that enables you to to keep His laws and to do His will. Okay. Our next question. Why Judas is so bad, they say so, but him never do bad like Peter, who curse bad words and tell lie, not so bad. Seek out YouTube. <laughs> well, I give him one better. He didn't even do bad like, probably like, um, like David, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> who killed a man to take away his wife. Yeah. But, um, but you know, um. The reason why, I mean, to betray Jesus, I mean, what worse could you do? Um, that is a very serious, a very serious thing to sell out God. Yes. If you really think about what Judas did, you know, um, the son of God, the king, the king of the universe, and he sold him out to the to the to the um, to the Sanhedrin council. Um, that is just so terrible. Yeah. And However, also, sorry, okay. No, no, I was going to say that, but they, you know, what was even worse, though, was that um, Judah spent so much time with Christ, so many years, you know, at least three years or so, and, um, and he never appropriate, he never understood what Jesus' mission was really about, and that he really came to save sinners, and that he could go to him for salvation, but he took his to, he took his own life out of, um, out of, I guess, remorse. Yeah, disappointment. Yes, yeah, disappointment. So, you know, and unfortunately. And also, um, the lack of repentance. He never repented. Right, no, so he, yeah, right. Yeah. He, yes, he never, he never repented of his sin. He had yeah. some um, regrets, yeah, but not you know, uh, but he never had a godly sorrow. Right, according to Second Corinthians chapter seven yes. verse ten, yes. he said, "Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death." So he had worldly sorrow. Worldly yeah. sorrow. Right, yes, but not the deep. Right, right. same worldly sorrow. He's mm -hmm. Sorry for the consequences. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. All right. Our right. next question from YouTube. Do I have to be baptized to be saved? And that's CJ. Um, yeah. Go ahead, hello. Well, the, the answer is um, <laughs> no and yes. <laughs> yes. Of, because people are going to always draw the example of the thief on the cross who, mm -hmm. who was not baptized, but yet still Christ promised that he would be saved in the kingdom. 
Uh, however, we read also in the gospel that uh, Jesus said that it is that, that it is um, mandatory for us to be baptized. So how do you reconcile the two? Well, but it, it's, it's very simple. You know, God is a, God understands our limitations and so if he understands if there is an impossibility for us to do something uh, he knows that we are about dust yes. and, and so he doesn't expect us to do the impossible. The thief on the cross could not be baptized because he died the same day that he received Jesus, like the, like the same hour of, yes. almost. But I think what the, what the Bible is saying and what Jesus is saying is that um, once you have the opportunity, once, the, once you accept the salvation and the opportunity is there, then it is imperative that you are baptized. If it, I might, the right is important. Yes, if I you, might chime in, El Lord, we remember the eunuch. Yes. Was, who said to the, the, the apostle, here is water, what hindered me? Yeah. Right. So he made good of that opportunity. Yes. And yeah. also, we must remember that baptism is a public declaration of yes. our faith in God. So why would you not declare it, you know, if you are really... Yeah. All right. So the next question here from Abigail McKnight. My question is, if I have already been baptized in a non Seventh day Adventist church, would I be required to be re baptized to join the Seventh day Adventist family from YouTube? So that's the question. And so my answer to that is that it, it depends because, the, you know, there is baptism and there is baptism. <laughs> I don't know what the, I, because there are different churches that practice different methods of baptism, but there is a biblical way. Uh, of baptism that is of immersion right. um, in, in, in the water and, and we saw what it represents from Romans 6 chapter 4 yeah. it means that it symbolizes the person dying the old person dying going into the grave the, which is symbolized by the water being buried mm -hmm. the old man and then risen to the newness of life that is what baptism um, symbolizes and it is important uh, for Jesus says that you know this is a ritual that that we uh, upon entering into the Christian faith yes. that we must part, we, we must do now um, as I said I don't know what um, what no. what method of baptism yes. that church that um, is it Abigail that Abigail yes, practices Abigail. Yeah, because if it is contrary to what is done in the Bible, to what is um, defined in the Bible, then that person would need to be rebaptized re according to the scriptures. Correct. Yeah. Um, yes. That's the last one. If I may extend on some more. So, Ella, if Abigail was baptized correctly according to the scripture, <laughs> yeah, I would go there. <laughs> I'll pull Ella leg because I know he's able to answer this one. <laughs> what then would you recommend if that person come to the church and say, boy, you know, I've been baptized by immersion. Yes. You know, how do you encourage that person whether or not they should still baptize? Again? Okay, so, so I would encourage, because you see, we have precedence in the Bible. Correct. Where, where uh, when, people, when one receives new light, new truth, then they are Rebaptized, yeah. like in, in, in Acts chapter 19. Yes. When Paul went to a certain town, I think it's in Berea or, or close to there, and um, he, he met Ghost. some believers who, 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 who got a better understanding, a deeper understanding of the gospel, and they were rebaptized. Right. So, I mean, I would, I would, I, I, you know, I would recommend that. Yes. However, um, it is not necessary if the person was baptized. According properly to according to the scriptures yes. and that person would then have to make a public declaration of belief in the truths that are practiced by the Seventh-day Adventist church and what and be called that profession of faith so right. the person would have to profess their faith um, that they believe in the in these in the other doctrines 
Or there's a follow-up question. What is the proper way to be baptized? Oh, so... And what are the improper ways? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was trying to be very diplomatic. Yes. <laughs> and not to, you know, um, cause any trouble. <laughs> but, but, okay, so the proper way is... I'll answer it this way. The proper way is what was defined in Romans 6, 4. Yes. And, the whole, and <clears throat> also how John baptized Jesus. The Bible said that um, the, John was baptized, but was baptized in the Jordan, in that part of the Jordan, because there was much water. water. And, uh, and then the Bible describes Jesus as going down into the water, into the water, and being submerged in the water, and then coming out of the water. Right, so he was buried under the water, yes. as it were. That is the proper way <clears throat> of baptism. Permit me, Ella, to read the text. Please. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So burial cannot be... Shallow or spring right. clean or so, so what I would say then So what I would say That is the proper way of baptism Correct. All other ways are improper Right <laughs> Okay Alright that is our last question From the chat Yes Okay well thank you Thank you um, Christine and Ron um, And thank you for participating Thank you online Abigail And, and, um, and the others for for your questions, keep them coming, keep the questions coming. We are here to answer them for you. And um, again, we want to remind you that we meet again on Wednesday, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, when we look at um, the hour of his judgment, part one. God bless you. See you there. Let's stand for prayer before we depart. Loving Lord, we thank you once again for your marvelous gift of salvation. We thank you for Jesus who came to redeem us. We thank you, O Lord, for the, 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 the proof that you have for those who are saved, who will go to heaven, whom you will reign with forever and ever. We thank you for all of this that you have provided for us. And now we ask that you bless your, your people, uh, those online and those who are in-house, Take us home safely who will be traveling home, Lord, and bring us back at another setting, the next session, where we continue to read more of your word in the book of Revelation. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you and see you on Wednesday.